During Desert Storm, there were seven aircraft carriers fighting the war, three located in the Red Sea and four located in the North Arabian Sea. The four in the North Arabian Sea comprised what was known as Battle Force Zulu. In this picture here, you can see Midway, upper left, Theodore Roosevelt, upper right, USS America, bottom right, and the USS Ranger, bottom left. The Ranger was actually the third oldest carrier of the seven in the region. Midway was the oldest, and the Saratoga was next oldest. Carrier Air Wing 2 was a board Ranger, and this was known as the Grumman Air Wing, meaning they didn't have any Hornets or A7s in their air wing. Instead, they added another A6 squadron to the air wing multiple. So their Grumman aircraft were the F-14A flown by VF-1, the Wolf Pack, which was the first F-14 squadron, and the Bounty Hunters of VF-2, and two A6 squadrons. I was actually part of an all Grumman air wing for my second deployment aboard Kennedy, until we discovered we had no harm shooters, so we had to take a detachment of A7s from VA-66 to add a harm capability to the air wing. But in any case, during Desert Storm, the Ranger didn't have any Hornets or A7s. So on the afternoon of February 6th, 1991, the Wolf Pack launched a two-plane on what's called an HVU escort, high-value unit, and in this case, the high-value unit was one of the air wing prowlers that was doing a jamming mission over occupied Kuwait. Now, at this point, Ranger and CAG-2 had been on station three weeks or so, and they'd been doing mostly combat air patrol missions in the Persian Gulf, what we call delousing missions, meaning as strike packages return to their various carriers that the delousing assets are supposed to make sure that there's no bandits in company. So at this point, the Tomcats have not seen a whole lot of action. In fact, the one time they could have had a shoot down, they missed the opportunity because they were on the wrong frequency. The bandits wound up getting shot down by Saudi F-15s that were behind the Tomcats. But in any case, this two plane launches in company with this prowler starts to head for Kuwait. Now in the lead airplane is actually the spare, meaning this was the airplane that was backing up the two Go Birds, the original lead airplane went down, so the spare launched with the second most junior pilot in the front cockpit, a guy named Lieutenant Scott, call sign Ash Mallon, and his Rio was Lieutenant Dan Zimby Zimberoff. And on their wing was the most junior pilot in the squadron, a guy who'd only been in the squadron for about a month, a guy named Lieutenant Stuart, call sign Meet. Brock, and in his back seat was the Wolfpack commanding officer, Commander Ron, callsign Bongo McElraft. The Tomcats were loaded four, four, and zero, which means four sidewinders, four sparrows, no Phoenix. You can see in this picture, the winders are on station one and eight, both A and B, and the sparrows are on the belly two through six. So that's a very lethal air-to-air -air loadout. Also, they have 500 rounds of 20 Mike Mike in the gun. So they made the call to not load Phoenix, figuring they wouldn't have the range to use the Phoenix. A lot of the MiG kills in Desert Storm were very short range, as we heard from Mongo in the episode where he described his MiG kill during the first day of the war in his Hornet. So the call sign they launch with is Wichita 103. Wichita is the tactical call sign of the Wolf Pack. For more on tactical call signs, please refer to the episode that I did about the difference between squadron nicknames, tactical call signs, and ATO call signs. But in this case, this two plane of Tomcats launches as Wichita 103. So they're up E2 control. They have a lengthy transit from the North Arabian Sea to Kuwait. Somewhere along the way, they get switched from the organic E2 control to AWACS control. Normally at that point, the squadron would assume their ATO designated call signs, but for some reason, this two plane of Tomcats stuck with Wichita 103. It's not known why that was the case. As they check in with the AWACS, they're told they have a change in mission, that they want them to flex from this HVU cap to a cap mission over the city of Basra. 
So these Tomcat crews are liking the way this mission is shaping up. This is the farthest north they've been so far during Desert Storm, and this area has been known for a lot of Iraqi MiG activity. However, along the way, the skipper's radar breaks down, and so they have to pass the tactical lead to Ash's airplane and let Zimby try to build the radar picture. They make it to their cap station, and they're orbiting there for about 10 minutes when the AWACS breaks the silence by saying, Wolfpack, engage bandit, vector 210 for 36, angels low, nose on. So Ash picks up a steer to that vector. They start to descend. Along the way, the skipper asks the AWACS for confirmation that they're cleared to fire. The AWACS comes back with affirmative, cleared hot, weapons free. At that point, Meat goes master arm on, and he says to the skipper, check recorder on, meaning the HUD recorder. The controller for that is in the back seat. In fact, Meat says this a couple of times, check recorder on, and he doesn't get a response. He assumes the skipper has turned the recorder on. So as they're driving towards this hostile contact, the skipper is pinging his wing Rio Zimbi for the radar picture. Zimbi's known as one of the better Rios in the squadron, but in spite of that, the AUG-9 was not designed for looking down over land at a low altitude target. So Zimby says he's clean. He, he doesn't have anything on the radar. So the AWACS keeps counting down the ranges and finally he says, you're merged. By this point, Meade has leveled off at 3000 feet. The skipper catches sight of a helicopter at their nine o'clock low. He says over the ICS, come left, helicopter. So Meade puts the airplane in a 7G nose low turn and he gets a tally on the helicopter. He IDs it as an MI-24, but it's actually an MI-8 HIP, which is a Soviet-built helicopter that the Iraqis have used for some years at that point. So with Ash flying high cover, Meat selects Winder and starts to roll in on this helicopter. Now, like we discussed during the Gulf of Sidra incident episode, the pilot does not need a radar lock to fire a Sidewinder. He just needs a tone, and that comes from finding the target's heat signature. You can fire a Sidewinder without a working radar. So as he's approaching this helicopter with rapid closure, he's fishing left and right. Finally, he gets a decent tone. Now, by this time, he's really low. In fact, the skipper is not happy about it. So over the ICS, he says, pull up, what the hell are you? At that point, Meat pulls the trigger, Fox 2, and the Sidewinder comes off station one on the left. It pulls massive lead off the rail. Meat's afraid it's not guiding, and he, he thinks it's guided on a heat signature coming off the desert. But then the missile does its thing, comes back hard to the right and hits the helicopter right above the starboard exhaust. At that point, Skipper goes up to Controlling Freak and says, uh, Splash One, and because he's not sure what kind of helicopter it is, it was just camouflage, he just says, Splash One, helicopter. So they climb back up to altitude, they hit the tanker, and they're not headed home yet. The AWACS sends them to a different cap station, so they hang out there for a while. In fact, they're airborne for another four hours on a variety of cap stations and doing different tasking. On the way back home, the AWACS ask them to do some battle damage assessment for a previous strike on Kuwait, so they do that. Again, they hit the tanker again. They come back. Now it's nighttime, so they're doing a Case 3 launch back on Ranger. And before they recover, one of their squadron mates launches and can't get the gear up. So they go up base frequency, Skipper and Meat join on their squadron mate who can't get the gear up. They're looking with a flashlight and they realize that the airplane still has the gear pins on the airplane. Those are supposed to be taken off before you launch. And if they aren't taken off, you cannot raise the gear. That airplane recovers, sidelined, take off the gear pins, launch, and goes on its mission. Ultimately, Meat and Bongo recover. So they get down to the ready room and they receive a raucous greeting from 30 or more squadron mates and the air wing commander, a guy named Rabbit Campbell. And then one of the maintainers rushes in and he's like, I can't find your HUD tape, where is it? And at that point, Meat looks at the skipper. He's like, where's the HUD tape? And the skipper sheepishly has to admit that he did not bring a HUD tape. So what's ironic is the skipper had given a lecture about three weeks before to the entire ready room and told the Rios that it is their responsibility to bring a HUD tape on each and every flight. So as a consequence of the skipper's error, there is no recorded documentation of this shootdown. So certainly Meat wasn't happy about that and the skipper 
was professionally embarrassed. So Wichita 103's helicopter kill was the only air-to-air -air kill by a Tomcat in Desert Storm. The Tomcats were hampered by their lack of an onboard PID capability. PID is positive identification. The Hornet had NCTR, non-cooperative target recognition that would allow them to determine friend or foe better than the F-14. And the Eagle had a really good PID capability, which gave them all of the best missions. So the Tomcat had a IFF interrogator. It worked on the DDD. You'd depress the IFF button and you'd get a code and mode line around a radar return. But it wasn't reliable enough, certainly for the joint arena, to be a step in an ROE matrix. And more than we wanted to kill MiGs, we wanted to prevent shooting down one of our own airplanes. And there was a huge risk with all of these carrier air wings and Air Force assets intermingled. Deconfliction was the biggest challenge. So you can see here in this box score of the 44 total victories over enemy aircraft, 37 of them were F-15C models. Two of those were Saudi Air Force F-15Cs. The only other Navy kills are the ones off of Saratoga, Mongo and Mark Fox, and they shot down two fish beds. What's also noteworthy is the AIM-7 Mike was used on 27 of those F-15C air-to-air -air kills. The AIM-9 Mike was only used on eight of them. It's a little surprising. And the Saudis used the AIM-9 Papa. They didn't have the Mike. The other Hilo kill besides Meat and Bongo on the box score is a Strike Eagle using a GBU-10, which is a guided bomb. And they shot down a Hughes 500, which was the same helicopter used in the TV series Magnum PI. So exactly three weeks after Meat and Bongo's MI-8 shootdown, Desert Storm ended. And as is the tradition in aviation during wartime, Wichita 103 had a silhouette of an MI-8 painted on the side of the fuselage. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber so you don't miss anything. Give me the likes and comment. Check the links below for merch and where to get the Punks Trilogy, my first three novels about life in a Tomcat squadron, just re-released by USNI Press. Use the discount code PUNKYT for 25% off. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the Super Thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again soon.